It's the underdogs back with you for another exciting sports extravaganza. I'm your host, Jordan Brenner, joined as always by the best co-host in the business, Peter Keating. Peter, how are you? Uh, I guess you could say we're back in the saddle, Jordan. That's right, because a little bit later in the show, we're going to introduce you to a new character, Railbird Keating. He's been (laughs) studying all the important factors for the Kentucky Derby. He's sipping mint juleps. He's wearing a crazy hat. Um, So we're going to get to that later. But first, Peter, NBA playoffs are in full swing. Last night was a crazy, crazy night that really sort of changed how we're going to view this first round going the rest of the way. I am, I am, I'm, I'm struggling to process all of it. After we saw the Knicks collapse, we saw the Bucks jump back in the series. What the hell's going on? I sidestepped your question before about how I am, because I am not doing well, Jordan. I am a Knicks fan who just watched Tyrese Maxey score. You check me on the exact number, but I believe it was 46 points in the last 30 seconds of the game <laughs> to beat the Knicks on a couple of really incredible plays. So. I don't want to take a great shot away from a great player. He's been unbelievable. And actually the biggest surprise of this whole playoffs to me so far has been the superstar max effort, max production play of maxi. Um, But we really are right on the verge of a couple of series tilting that are now we're tilting one way, completely crashing the other way. So it's exciting, but it's also good Lord. It's nerve wracking. Yes. So big picture. Let's the West is pretty much, you know, done for now, right? You've got already you have the Nuggets set up to face the Timberwolves. And I want to get into that series in a little bit. You have the Nuggets set to face the Timberwolves in a sort series we're going to get into in a little bit. Meanwhile, you have the Thunder waiting on the winner of the only competitive series in the West. That's the Clippers against the Mavericks. But the East is a mess. We assume the Celtics are going to dispose of a just completely banged up and done Miami Heat team, but You've got three, three, two series, the Knicks, the Sixers, uh, the Bucks, Pacers, and that Magic Cavs non-scoring series. And that's the other big story, Peter, early in these playoffs, is we know scoring started to decline in the second half of the regular season. We know referees were calling fewer fouls. There were fewer free throws. That's been looked at as the biggest change in terms of allowing more physical play. But here are some stats in the playoffs that's even more pronounced, okay? Last year, in the first round of the playoffs, there were 43 games, so 86 team scores, right? Mm -hmm. 19 of those 86 times, a team scored below 100, so that's 22% of the time. And three total games featured teams that both scored under 100 points, Um, so 7% of the the 43 games, okay? This year, there have been 36 first-round games so so far, 72 scores. 26 times teams have been held below 100 points. That's 36% of the time, way up from last year. And six full games, twice as many as last year, in fewer games have ended with both teams under 100. So you're starting to see scores that resemble more typical playoff games as opposed to last year when it was, it was still like 120s, the teens, even up to 130. Um, what are you thinking of this? How are you? How is it changing the way you're watching the NBA? Do you think it helps underdogs at all? So back in the 90s, uh, there was either a pizza or a taco place that ran a promotion in Madison Square Garden that said anytime the Knicks held an opponent to under 90 points, they'd get free food, free slice of pizza or a taco, whatever it was. Then they started doing that every single night. So the place lowered its promotion to 80 points. (laughs) Knicks had to hold someone under 80 to get the free pizza slice. This is what that is reminding me of, which is that you calibrate your entire expectation way down. And, And what's doing is it's hurting teams that ran like wild, scored 100 or 115 or 120 points at will early in the season and expected to be able to carry that play over. Teams that are really fast or really physical on defense are being helped a lot by this. Orlando and Indiana are both being helped by this. I think Minnesota was helped by this a lot against Phoenix because all of a sudden the physical presence of Minnesota was even more effective against the small ball of Phoenix than we thought the union you know, both like Minnesota to begin with, but Minnesota wiped them out in part because Phoenix could not get anything going that involved anything physical at all. So I think it is helping particular teams. I'm not sure that's what's making a difference in the Milwaukee or Philly, New York series. No, but- I, 
Yeah, I agree. I mean, I- I- Indiana, for instance, is a very fast paced team anyway. So is Milwaukee and those scores are high still, but we've seen, you've mentioned that the Cleveland in Orlando series is like a mid early two thousands, you know, 96, yes. 86 games, 97, 83. Um, I want to harp on a team you just mentioned though, because I think this is where it gets interesting is the next round Minnesota against Denver. We've talked a lot about how we enjoy when teams zig when others zag, right? And for yes. Minnesota, that was playing two bigs, and it didn't work so well last year, but they've stuck with it. We talked about how the lineups featuring both Rudy Gobert and Carl Anthony Towns were significantly better this season. Yes. And the question is always, <clears throat> are teams going to be able to play Rudy Gobert off the floor in the playoffs? Well, if you can be more physical – and right. it's a little bit less of a pace and space game that makes it that much harder. And now it's fascinating to see what Jokic is going to be able to do or not do against Gobert, what Denver's ball movement and player movement and two man games will be able to do. They split the season series two two. But if Minnesota can be more physical, can stay big, I think they've got a real upset chance. Do you agree? I absolutely agree, and I think it's particularly important because Carl Anthony Towns is coming off the meniscus injury. So in the first three games of the series against Phoenix, he was limited to 24, 27 minutes a game. But that did not mean that they tried to match Phoenix in going smaller or play Kyle Anderson more. No, they put more guys in to shoot more often and stayed physical. And McDaniels and Alexander Walker took turns scoring at, at a great clip, 16, 18, 25 points a night, they were able to, they've been able to keep, and then by game four, Towns was back up to 34, 35 minutes a game. So they were able to keep this style going, even when the matchup, even when injury suggested that they were going to have to adjust, they have kept this experiment going. And I think you're right in this environment. It's a, it's a kind of a big boost to them. I, I love watching this team play for exactly the same reason you outlined, which is that they look, they play different. They believe in something. They're sticking to it. I want to ask you something though. Sure. Minnesota is one of those teams, like many, um, the only other example I can think of are the Knicks because it's happened with Thibodeau so many years where players on his teams have led the league in minutes played. Minnesota plays everyone all the time, right? They, they were they were famous for not resting players during the season. Um, can this wear down a max effort team or do you expect the very physical teams have gotten that way because of their conditioning and that fatigue and getting banged up, a possibility of injury isn't going to be more of a factor because that's the thing that concerns me in this environment where it's a lot more bang around that, that go a lot more fouls that go uncalled a lot less space to work in are, are the big physical teams more likely to get tired or hurt? I don't think playing physical will make you m- more tired. Look, the, the, the wolves have the best defense in the league i don't think that you know that's not going to go away that's not going to go away because they're deeper in the season it's 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 schematic it's player-based and honestly in in the regular season you know their minutes weren't weren't crazy i mean yeah anthony edwards played 35 minutes a night and rudy gobert played 34 minutes a night but they played a bunch of guys over 20 they have some depth i don't think it's not like a crazy Thibodeau like situation. Um, and they still played their bench guys in the playoffs. I well, and look in that case, you we just you just made the first mention of Edwards, who who's averaging what 38 6 in this series. I mean, in addition to the big men, they got this emerging huge superstar. So well, that's the uh thing. so he has you know, taken he has taken the this yeah, he has taken this incredible leap. The other thing I'm gonna point out is the Timberwolves. I'm gonna throw it to our, our college basketball analysis a little bit. The Timberwolves have a little chameleon ability, and I'll tell you why, okay? According to the amazing stat site, Ben Fox, cleaning the glass, uh, Timberwolves were only 20th in the NBA in three-point shooting frequency, okay? Everyone shoots a lot of threes, but they weren't up at the Celtics level of like 43%, like they were in like 35% of their shots were from three. But they led the NBA outside of heaves in three-point accuracy. So whenever you have a team that makes a lot of threes and doesn't take as many as others, there's room for growth. So in a situation where you're the underdog, they could dial up the variance a little more, take more threes. Now that's not the way they play, but they really do have, have some outstanding shooters led by their top two scores towns and, and 
Edwards. So all of this is a really long winded, winded way to say that I think they're much better positioned than they were against the Nuggets last year. But I still think the Nuggets are going to win the series. <laughs> well, you know, uh, after watching what happened to Anthony Davis, who played pretty well most of the time, but just got destroyed by Jokic. Um, I mean, how much of what happened to the Lakers is just the lack of coaching, the lack of depth? I mean, expecting Austin Reeves to go up with the likes of the Nuggets and the Nuggets better depth. I mean, how much of it is just we should have seen it coming? Because I, it gets me a little worried if you or I on one side of an argument and the whole world is saying, oh, you know, we are surprised that Minnesota handled Phoenix this way. And we're just we're surprised that Denver handled the Lakers this way. I'm kind of not surprised. We've been on the T-Wolves for a long time. And, I, I, and why would we get off now? Yeah, but I'm not sure who's surprised Denver handled the Lakers this way. Denver's they're the defending NBA championships. They're a great team. They have arguably the best player on the planet and two guys who play off him beautifully in Jamal Murray, Michael Porter Jr., and a versatile all-round, do-everything, defend guy in Aaron Gordon. They're a, a beautifully constructed team. They don't have a lot of depth. You want to talk about depth, that's Denver's problem. But that starting five is just, just exquisitely constructed. They complement each other beautifully. Um, and I still think they're going to win the championship. But I don't know what the hell is going to happen in the East. I don't, I don't, I can't, Peter... I know you're mourning uh, uh, the, the Knicks right now, and uh, uh, but can you think of one team remaining in the East that's even going to pose a slight challenge to Boston going forward? Like maybe Milwaukee, if if they somehow rebound from this three-two deficit, get Lillard and Giannis back, and there's something there. But do you see anything going on? Is there an well, East underdog? No, you know, legs? sometimes sometimes when you get a deserving number one seed who cuts through the first round or two of the playoffs, you tend to just stop talking about them. Like we haven't mentioned the thunder, for example. I mean, Boston is an overwhelming favorite for good reason. And, you know, we've said this many times, uh, the one thing that they didn't do well, or they needed more of, they addressed by getting Porzingis. Right. And, mm -hmm. um, they're taking care of business. And, um, I don't think there's any reason to expect them not to. I do think if it comes to it, the Nick Celtic series will be entertaining um, I don't think this Sixers run uh, is anything for anybody to be too concerned about. We don't know yet as of the time we're talking right now what's going to happen. But as a Knicks fan, you, you listen, you get one four-point play in a lifetime, <laughs> right? Uh, the Sixers just had theirs. They stole a game. The Knicks stole a game earlier in the series. And, um, you know, apart from Joel Embiid's surprisingly dirty play, um, you know, what, what you see is what you get. The Knicks are probably the better team and uh, it's a gut wrenching loss to go through in this, this, this collapse, but it was a bunch of flukes. There's no reason to expect the Knicks not to take care of the Celtics. I well, think. these games have, hold on. First of all, these games against Philly have all been close. It's not like they're blowing them out. So I think you're, you're way overrating the Knicks chances of, of surviving this series. The biggest thing for Boston, look, the Porzingis injury matters, but still like the Celtics are minus 200 to win the East. And I'm sure I'm not. I'm. I think there's still value there. I just these teams are yeah. are just not even at their low. The Knicks. Porzingis, are the next... Porzingis, by the way, is going to be back in time for the next round, right? I mean, he's out for. A I few don't days. think so. I, I don't. All I, right. I, but I, I I'd be surprised. But we'll see. Well, the the info is still coming in. I was reading something from uh, Jeff Stotts online, who who's right. does is so great with NBA injuries, and you know, I thought he he said it'd be more of a couple week thing, like Giannis had, but. The Knicks are the second team at plus 425, and then it jumps all the way to win the East to the Pacers at plus 1,100. Like, there's just, you know, you could really see, as much as I love Denver, like the five teams remaining in the West, like, they all have a potential to get hot and do something. I just, the Celtics are just so much better than these other teams. And, like, the most disappointing one to me is Cleveland because there's a lot of talent there, and they are just playing down right now to level their competition. They should... They, I love Orlando. I love what they're building. They're pesky. They're well coached, but this this shouldn't be as tight a series as it's been. Um, and I just don't have any confidence in Cleveland going up against Boston. And so, with my remaining twenty seconds or whatever, let me throw <laughs> one. With, I've done this before. Let me throw a pitch in to appreciate what Dallas is doing. Dallas is now tied with the Clippers. Dallas not likely to go too much further if they manage to win this series. It'll be have been a great season, but. The Clippers have, you know, the Clippers have thrown everything they can at Luca, and Luca is playing out of his mind. In game two of this series, the primary defender, okay, people shooting 
uh, Clippers shooting against Luca were two of 16. I mean, he's grabbing massive rebounds. Um, and not only that, their experiment of trying to find big men who can defend has been working. I mean, PJ Washington yeah, yeah. plus so 23 in the last successful- game. Why is it a successful season for them if they have a nice series against the Clippers? Because they won 50 games and they re-engineered their team in the middle of the season on the fly. And because they have to go through this gauntlet you've been talking about in the West. You have a transcendent superstar in Luka Doncic. You've got a guy making a zillion dollars with playoff with caliber, you know, success in his past and Kyrie Irving. That's you're setting the bar way too low for what this team okay, should be. Okay, well then fine. Oh. I'll I'll predict they'll beat the Clippers and give okay. uh, Oklahoma City some fits. But the last time I brought up Dallas, you were like, "Yeah, well they just beat the Wizards." You were so down on Dallas right after the trades when I said, "Watch for Kyrie and Luca to work well together because they have big men who can defend now." And you were like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's not call them the next Nuggets." And I was like, "Okay." I was just trying to hedge a little bit for my own safety, but I like Dallas and I like what they've been doing. Yeah, no, I think the PJ Washington move was was really savvy. Um, and he's just fit in perfectly there. And you can also sort of see where they're headed if Derek Lively continues to develop. Yes. Um, you know, the, yes, uh, you know, he is the perfect sort of modern Tyson Chandler, rim running, shot blocking, um, defensive big man. Uh, it's a question. You know, it's Keeps always things lively here. on the defensive end. That's a good slogan. Uh, you're such a dope. well. Speaking of lively, we're going to get into some lively horse racing discussion um as we prepare for um the run for the roses this saturday so we'll be back to talk about that right after this 